so there is this philosopher, Russian philosopher, Russian early 20th century philosopher Pavel Vladensky, who had this idea about portrait, which I always found thought-provoking, to say the least. So for Florensky, photography is a mechanical reproduction. We also should take his concept with a grain of salt, because at the time when he was writing about it, photography was not as developed as right now, so um, it took longer time to just take a picture, take one picture of a person, and so it was very static, very confusing, uncomfortable for for everyone, especially for the one who was photographed, while making a portrait, uh, making an image of a person, be that a painting or a drawing, it definitely takes more time than taking a picture, a photograph, even in the early 20th century it was still much longer to paint a person, but it also was a process that was made from different perspectives. So Florensky, he was particularly interested in perspective and how perspective changed throughout different periods in time, like the invention, basically invention of the perspective during Renaissance and how it affected the vision and just in general how people perceived the world, perceived beauty, perceived sublime. And so perspective and the point of view is very important for Florensky. And what he was saying is that during a session when an artist is making a portrait, yes, they would choose specific position, but in specific angle, but it might change. Uh, it will also definitely change with, with lighting and the changes natural changes in lighting throughout the day, it will be affected by the fact that a person is not a real person, is not a sculpture, like a person would definitely change their positions, they would just move. And also during the portrait sessions there probably will be some dialogue going on when an artist is learning about someone who he or she is painting. A portrait is a window to one's soul. So basically what Florensky is saying is that an artistic portrait is infinitely more dense than a photographic image, because it condensely summarizes all of the features from multiple angles that an artist sees when he is engaging in a conversation or just is sitting in front of a person in real life. So now I wanted to discuss several portraits that at least I personally find very memorable and they imprinted in my heart and and also in my mind for many many years because all of them I remember from magazines um, from art gallery magazines or which were magazines that I collected as a child and these magazines are what made me interested in art in the first place. So the first portrait that I'm gonna talk about is portrait of Nestor Kukolnik by Karl Brilov. Karl Brilov was a 19th century artist, very successful even during his lifetime, which is not the case for a lot of artists. And his most famous painting probably is The Last Day of Pompeii. It's very epic, an epic painting. And even in this painting, 
in this historical epic painting, we can still find a lot of material for portrait appreciation because each character from this painting has a lot going on, obviously, because there is an eruption of a volcano and each character is different. Their psychological state is different. You can you can read a story in each of these faces. And there is also an Easter egg with the self-portrait of the artist, which can be also found in this painting. So Nestor Kukulnik was a poet and a playwright, pretty famous during his lifetime. One of his most famous poems is Doubt, that was also made into a ballad by Mikhail Glinka, a famous composer who was also a friend of Nestor Kukulnik, and both of them were also friends with the artist, with Karl Brilov, so they kind of had this trio. Um, and at the time when Brilov lived in Russia, because for, I think, more than 10 years he spent in Italy, because at the time Russian artists who successfully graduated from the Russian Academy of Arts, they were granted with the opportunity to study in Italy, um, study with Italian masters. Not a lot of Russian artists during their time in Italy would become also pretty famous in Europe, but in the case of Brilov he was pretty famous and pretty well loved in um, in Italy at the time, and so he spent quite some time there. But when he went back to Russia, he also was in this circle, in this creative circle with Nestor Kukalnik and with Mikhail Glinka. I decided to begin with this portrait because it is considered as one of the first truly psychological masterpieces in Russian portrait. According to Belinsky, a Russian literary critic, on the face of Kukalnik you can read quote, morbid daydreaming, that was characteristic of Russian intellectuals at the time, and was explained by Belinsky as an overabundance of vital forces that did not find any use. Even background in this portrait also gives us a hint about the psychological state of Kukolnik, because as you can see, in the upper right side of this portrait, there is a peeling plaster that exposes the brick wall. According to a number of art historians, it is a symbol of a mental wound. We can also see that Kukolnikov's hands, both of his hands actually, they are forcefully clenched. He doesn't really look like a person who is relaxed despite the fact that he was posing for his friend, for his very, very good friend. When painting this portrait, Brilov argued that he wanted to present a kind of romantic doubt, which was a definitive characteristic of people at, at the time, of creative people at the time. I've seen somewhere that this portrait was in Harry Potter, I think it was in, a, um, in Dumbledore's office or something like that, if, if my memory is correct. I mean, I can Google it, but I, but I don't really want to. The second portrait that I want to talk about is a portrait of the composer Modest Petrovich Mussorgsky by one and only Ilya Repin. This portrait is yeah, very different from the one that we were talking about before, because despite Karl Brilov capturing very realistically Kukolnik's emotions and his mental state, this portrait is still very romantic in its essence, while there is nothing 
romantic about this portrait of Mussorgsky. Artists and writers at the time wanted naked truth in opposition to 30s, 40s idealists. There were various shifts, first and foremost social, economical and political shifts that were the result of the abolishment of serfdom. We see this embodied fully in Repin's Uver, famously his barge haulers on the Volga shows this naked truth. But it can also be seen in this portrait. So Modest Mussorgsky was a composer, a genius composer, who also suffered from alcoholism. From February of 1881 he was put into a hospital. This portrait was painted in just four sessions, from 14th till 17th of March, and nine days later, after this portrait was finished, Mussorgsky died. And I wouldn't say that this is a portrait of a defeated man, because, yes, he's sad, like he's not put together, but it is also a man who looks into the eyes of death without fear, he knows what inevitably waits him. All of the details in this portrait also show that Repin did not flatter Mussorgsky in any way. The color of the nose unambiguously indicates the nature of the disease that brought the composer to his grave so early. But it is also made in such a careful way. There is love and care in how this man is portrayed. Repin painted Mussorgsky in the most vulnerable state, but still not defeated. Another sip. So, another portrait that I'm going to talk about. You probably can guess from my background. It's the portrait by John Sargent, the portrait of Lady Agnew, which I got this reproduction several days ago for the sake of this video, and I couldn't stop staring at her. This portrait is so pleasant to look at. I feel that the allure of this portrait lays not only in the fact that this woman is very beautiful, and also not only because the attire, the outfit that she wears is very tender, it's also very calming, soothing and pleasing to look at, but also in her pose. This pose is so relaxed and so natural. And as far as I'm concerned, from what I've read about this portrait, this pose was chosen by Sargent because this was the exact pose that she had when they first met. She will just like, naturally, effortlessly sit in this pose. And I think that this is what makes this portrait so special. It is just a portrait of a woman who is chic, she's confident, and is comfortable. And it's not surprising for me that this portrait was very successful when it was first exposed. And the last but not least is portrait of an unknown woman by Ivan Kramskoy, painted in 1883. This painting appeared at first at the 18th exhibition of Pirdvizhniki, or Society for Traveling Art Exhibitions. As I mentioned when I was talking about Repin, after 60s, a lot of artists and writers, they were interested in realistic art. There was a kind of revolutionary movement at the time of artists rejecting some official events, 
like official exhibitions that were organized by the academy and they were organizing their own exhibitions because they were not allowed to paint on their own terms in official institutions and so they decided well okay we will make our own thing and one of such organizations was the Society for Traveling Art Exhibitions or Piridvizhniki. So yeah it was first presented in one of these exhibitions and it immediately attracted tons tons and tons of attention and people were so puzzled by who this woman is because there is a very well I would say salacious detail about this portrait or not a detail what was salacious about it was the title because Kromskoy specifically decided to name this painting not a stranger which would be even intuitively very appropriate because one can imagine seeing such beautiful woman in a carriage that passes by and she is a stranger to you like you are mesmerized with her beauty this is a woman that you would definitely turn your head to take a glance once again so in this regard she will be a stranger to you but he chooses the title the unknown lady or the unknown woman and this was very puzzling for a lot of people why doesn't he want to name who this woman is because it kind of implied um, that he wants this woman to be unknown to be anonymous viewers and colleagues literally begged Kramskoy to tell them who is depicted in the portrait. However, the artist did not change his decision. So despite this mystery around the identity of this woman, from several details of this painting we kind of can guess at least what place she occupied in the society at the time. Everything about her outfit speaks of the fact that she was really interested in fashion and was interested in what was popular at the time. And this was actually a sign that her social status was not the upper class. Because for the upper class, the unwritten code, uh, the un unwritten rule was to avoid following fashion and the fact that she is dressed so fashionably shows that she probably belonged to a class of women supported by wealthy lovers or Dama Polusveta and in this regard this portrait was criticized for instance this woman was called a coquette in a carriage or an expensive camellia and in general her moral status was questioned and it was questioned why Kramskoy chose this model to be to be portrayed in such a in such a way in such an alluring way like they were waiting for some kind of social criticism underneath it this is why there is an interpretation of this work that she actually symbolizes this conflict between aesthetics and ethics between the beauty that is let's say moral and the earthly beauty and a curious thing about this portrait and about interpretations of this portrait was that since this portrait was first exhibited, opinions divided immediately. Yes, there were people who were saying that, yes, this is a coquette, she is, she represents an earthly beauty that might be alluring, but 
she is morally questionable and this is desire for a body for a carnal beauty but at the same time since the beginning there were people who claimed that this is actually the embodiment of femininity that this beauty is actually very pure and i find it amazing that the same portrait can be interpreted in quite opposite manners and this painting was destined to become popular not only in the 1880s but it excited the public in the 20th century and even up to this day but let's get back to the unknown lady herself what can we read in this face because her beauty is really mysterious and different people also read different emotions here i've read interpretations about her facial expression as pride and even contempt i guess probably not so much her face but the position of a viewer here is beneath her and maybe this make us feel like she is looking i mean she's literally looking from um, from the higher position so she's looking down on us and this kind of shows that yeah maybe she just only recently got her wealth and yeah she's staring at us with a little bit of contempt and vanity but there is also it's a very humane facial expression there is also sadness in it and even understanding there is this tendency to seek some allusions in literary works at least in russia so this unknown woman was linked to anna karenina from tolstoy's novel others saw the heroine of the novel the idiot by dostoevsky and later the unknown lady was associated with the stranger from a poem by block and i want to end this late night art history session with reading this poem by alexander block the unknown lady is sometimes considered as an illustration for this poem though there is no direct link between them first and foremost because the portrait was made several years before like even i think 20 years before the poem was written and we have no idea whether a block even i mean Pro block probably knew about this artwork but he never really mentioned that it affected him in any way in any shape or form so it's just public opinion kind of linked them together and i personally think that this comparison of two of these artworks is very far-fetched because for me the the stranger that is described in in Bloch's poem is a more of a tragic figure but also a faceless figure because in this poem Bloch describes how each night he goes to a bar and he drinks himself to the oblivion we know from actually from biography of block that at the time he suffered from jealousy his wife was cheating on him with another writer he was in huge pain and he suffered and he just wanted to completely forget everything while drinking and during these nights he probably saw a woman that mesmerized him that was so mysterious always in black always alone and probably because she was on her own and in black and very beautiful people might associate her with the portrait of the unknown lady but i think that the tone of the poem and the painting is a little bit different maybe after I read this poem you will disagree with me and yeah I'm going to read this poem in Russian 
and I will put in subtitles the translation in English and in Chinese. По вечерам над ресторанами горячий воздух дик и глух, и правят окриками пьяными весенний и тлетворный дух. Дали над пылью переулочной, над скукой загородных дач, чуть золотится крендель пулочный и раздается детский плач. И каждый вечер за шлагбаумами, заламывая котелки, среди канав гуляют с дамами, испытанные остряки. Над озером скрипят уключные и раздается женский виск, а в небе ко всему приученный бессмысленно кривится диск. И каждый вечер друг единственный в моем стакане отражен и влагой терпкой и таинственной, как я смирен и оглушен. А рядом у соседних столиков лакеи сонные торчат, и пьяницы с глазами кроликов инвина, веритас кричат. И каждый вечер в час назначенный или это только снится мне, девичий стан шелками схваченный, в туманном движется окне. И медленно, пройдя меж пьяными, всегда без спутников одна, дыша духами и туманами, она садится у окна. И веют древними повериями ее упругие шелка. И шляпа с траурными перьями, И в кольцах узкая рука. И странной близостью закованной Смотрю за темную вуаль, И вижу берег очарованный И очарованную даль. Глухие тайны мне поручены, Мне чье-то солнце вручено, И все души мои излучены Пронзило терпкое вино. Перья страуса склоненные в моем качаются мозгу, И очи синие и бездонные цветут на дальнем берегу. В моей душе лишит сокровище, и ключ поручен только мне. Ты право, пьяное чудовище, я знаю истинно в вине. So, The Stranger by Alexander Block. So, it's almost 4 a.m. And I think that it's time to go sleep.